Hello, Barb. Hi, Cynthia. How are you? I'm wonderful. I'm I'm having such a great December. How about you? It's good. It's good. It's I can't believe how fast November has gone by. You know, we were so busy in November, and now it's already December, and this morning it snowed a little bit. Yeah, I I like I like the dusting of snow. I have to admit, mm -hmm. uh, I think it just makes it feel a little more festive. I, it's been a long time since we've had a Christmas uh, without any snow on the ground. It has. It really has. Yeah. But let's start with an introduction, Barb. Yeah. Uh, this is podcast on brought to you from Yarniversity by River City Yarns, and we are Barb and Cynthia. Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. It's nice to be back. It's been a whole month and I've missed everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you've been away as well. You want to tell mm -hmm. us uh, where you've where you've been and what you've been doing? Yeah, well, um, it was Mario's birthday in November. His birthday's on November 11th. And it's our sort of memorial day or our remembrance day here in Canada. And so he uh, wanted to go to visit some car people that he knows about. And, and so he booked a trip to Texas and I kind of tagged along. It was so much fun. He got to see a few YouTube kind of guys that he's followed for a long time and visit their shops in Texas. And I got to go to a knitting shop. Nice. Oh, really? Yeah. And you met up with a, I think you met up with a friend or two as well. Yes. Well, well, I asked a few people to give me recommendations of their favorite shops in the Dallas area where we were going to be. And um, Elaine told me about McKinney Knittery in a little town called McKinney. And I um, also got the thumbs up from Carissa Browning, as well as uh, a few other folks. Uh, so I knew from a few really good friends that this was the place to go if, um, you know, you wanted to see a unique yarn and fabric store. Mm -hmm. So I've got, I did a little video and um, filmed it from the perspective of actually driving into the downtown of this historic town. There's some beautiful old houses really close to the downtown area. And they, uh, it happened to be the uh, sort of like Black Friday, Cyber Monday kind of weekend, Thanksgiving mm -hmm. when we were there. And so the whole town was decorated with um, Christmas decorations already and a big tree. Nice, nice. Now, I've had the privilege of watching your video and your discussion, your chat with um, Ginger, the owner yes. of yeah. McKinney Knittery. So I noticed at the very end, you included a picture of a hat. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the hat? That was fun. So I asked Elaine if she would like to be on the video with me talking to Ginger. And she said, no, no, she, she was too shy. And so um, we, we, I kind of respected that and kept all of the customers off camera as much as I could. But on the way back to my hotel, Elaine and her friend Kathy were so generous. They gave me a ride back to the hotel as opposed to having to take an Uber and we went the back roads. It took us 45 minutes and we had the greatest chat all about fun times. And Elaine showed me her latest hat that she had knit. It was one of Nancy Bates hats from the park book. Yeah. And uh, it was uh, it was beautiful. I had to take a picture of it. Nice. So that's Nancy Bates knitting the national parks, that book. Yeah. Yes, that book. Yeah. I can't remember which park she had knit, she made, but was so pretty that's she, lovely so there's a little cameo of elaine's hat in in the video so uh that'll come up in a little bit on our uh as we as you continue to uh stay on with us we've got this beautiful video to show you of mckinney knittery in mckinney texas and elaine's hat has a special place right at the end of the video so stay tuned to watch for that yeah um trip. 
Yeah, I'm glad you got to take it, you know, before sort of like the holiday season. So I guess my next question, Barb, is are you ready for the holiday season? Are you ready for winter? Like I, what's what's on your needles right now? I feel like I am. You know, um, we took Ann Bud's Design Your Own Sweater class, and I actually got mine designed and finished. Oh. I, here, I'll show you up. Stand up. Nice. Yeah, I wanted to do a cardigan, and um, I wanted to do it out of fine yarn. And this was a fingering weight merino that I found in uh, Boulder at a yarn shop there. So. I was really happy that uh, I could make it and put it all together. There are things that I probably will do differently the second time when I do it. But what it's done is it's given me a template to work from for future sweaters. So I'm really excited about that. And I'm going to do another one, make some changes to it. No, my sweater is still in swatches. Uh, I haven't gotten as far as you have. But I think Barb, you had an event with this sweater that you showed us, which is beautiful, by the way. Thank you. I think uh, you made this one on your knitting machine. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I did it on my knitting machine, the pieces, um, and I finished it all by hand. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And seen it all together. So um, it was faster you know, than hand knitting it, especially because it's in fine yarn. Um, but I really found that it took a lot of time to put the pieces together. Mm -hmm. And that's where I wanted to really spend my time was on the finishing. Well, I imagine a project like that on the knitting machine not only taught you a lot about, you know, designing your own sweater based on your own gauge and on your own measurements, but it also taught you a lot about using the knitting machine as well oh for sure yeah yeah it did and kind of um some of the finishing like I could have done the whole neck band and and the bandings by machine but um I tried it and they just didn't turn out like I wanted them to so you know there's nothing like doing your own three rows out of four you know when you're picking up a band right, right. Yeah, when it's in your hands, you can actually kind of see how it's going to turn out and make changes on the fly. Yeah. So, well, I just want to say, you know, as your sister and as your business partner, I think like kudos to you, Barb, for taking on these projects on your machine, because I think that, you know, that's what makes us better at whatever we're doing, right, is taking classes and then putting it to practice. So I, you know, feel a little bit embarrassed that I've only got swatches done on mine, but it, it'll come. I've got, I've got feel. planning out some time for it, but, you know, kudos to you for continuing to work on, uh, on your machine and on getting, becoming better and better at it. I think every time you, every time you pull out another project, I just, I think, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And so I want to, you give... know, <laughs> I just want to say my time is shorter than yours. <laughs> I, I, I have less and less time to knit, so I have to hurry up. <laughs> okay, we won't get into, we're not going to dig into that one. I, uh... oh, okay, all right. <laughs> You're fine, right? You're healthy. Everything's good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you never. <laughs> there's only so much time at the end of the day. So if I can use my knitting machine to speed up some of the, you know, plain old stock net sections, I feel that um, there's a place for everything in Absolutely. our crafting. Absolutely. And I want I want it I want it to be clear that I think, you know, I don't think that, you know, it, I don't think that it's a cheat. It's not I, cheating, you're saying. No. Not at all. I think uh, I think that, you know, again, it's like I, I keep thinking about I should pull out my spinning wheel and get back to spinning yarn and I should pull out my loom, my knitter's loom and, you know, make something. And I, it's a struggle, right? Because we've got to choose between what we're going to pay attention to, what we're going to practice. And so yeah. I, I really heartfelt want to say, you know, kudos to you for taking the time to really invest your energy into learning how to use the knitting machine to its best, you know, 
to its best, right? And, yeah. and that requires practice and it requires oh a lot of projects. Yeah. It really and, does. And thank you for acknowledging that because, you know, you think, oh, I can just whip up a sweater. Well, that's not the case. I can't, can't tell you how many fronts I actually made before I landed on this one. And I had to take my back and cut it in two because there were too many stitches for the needle bed. So there's all kinds of things that require a lot of thought and pre-planning. And when, you know, I'm knitting a sweater by hand, I can do that thinking about it while I'm knitting. This one I had to do on the front end. So it, it really did take a lot of time to think things through and figure it out. Yeah. And math, which I'm not the best at. Yeah. And now you're you're kind of translating some of this experience and investment in your time and your research and your you know skill set to teach others. And so I yeah. want to let everybody know that there's some you know, there's a there's an exciting class on machine knitting coming up in January. So maybe just tell us a wee bit about that and then we'll move back to. OK, sure. I, I know I feel a little guilty. I think sometimes people think, oh, machine knitting, that's not really you know, really hand knitting. and But, you know, um, again, I think we all need all the tools that we can get in our portfolio. And I'm proud of what I've done on my machine. I did lace hand warmers that I'm gifting for Christmas that are so beautiful. I can't tell you how nicely they turned out on my machine. And I can do a pair of those in an evening or two. Mm -hmm. So it's probably not that much faster than hand knitting. I think I could do one of those in in a couple of hours, hand knitting, uh, but, but it turned out really nice. And uh, the last class that we did, too, was all on um, bias knitting. So pretty. This is another Christmas gift, Cynthia. This is handmaiden silk. It's lovely. Modern that I put into a big bias that you can double up or wear twice around your neck. And the fabric is so beautiful and squishy. This has to go to someone really, really special for Christmas who loves purple. Mm, love those purple colors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in January, Barb, what are you teaching in January? Oh, for the machine socks. I'm teaching socks. I know. <laughs> I, like I, I, I thought, can we do socks on our LK one hundred and fifty knitting machines? And you can. There's lots of patterns for them. A lot of them are um, a little heavier sock, sort of like a boot sock. Um, but I found an instruction for one, and I'm trying it on fingering weight yarn. I picked up a skein of this when I was in um, McKinney. Nice. They have spin cycle there, and this is a sport weight, so this will be a little heavier sock. But I'm doing some on fingering weight, and I'm doing them with a traditional heel flap because I like a traditional heel flap. It's my favorite. It just fits me, and nobody – I couldn't seem to find any sort of YouTube videos with that in fingering weight. So I'm hopeful that it will be something that – people will resonate with our customers and want to do some as well. I'm, I'm just sure. going to do a kid's sock, like a small one. Yeah. 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 That's, that sounds, that sounds really intriguing. So that's coming up at the beginning of January. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Well, before we get there, so uh, th this is your, your, your grand finished object is your beautiful sweater. What else have you, uh, have you got other finished objects that you'd like to share? Yeah. Before I, I went away to Texas, I showed you I was taking some uh, mittens with me. This is our shinny mitten pattern from Ann Bud. Yeah. It uses fingering weight yarn. Uh, this is in our Adam and Eve. And then I, it has a liner. <laughs> That's fun. Isn't that fun? Yeah. So this was my first mitten. I think I had this one done or almost done. And I ran out of this mohair. I only had a little bit left. I think I robbed it and put it in another project. So I used, uh, I got another skein of Ito from McKinney Knittery. Mm -hmm. Ito. 
And this is a beautiful mohair. I got one in a bright orange and I put that in the middle and did some stripes. And so these are just, I uh, just washed these and they're, they're sort of drying right now. And then I'll just push this liner back inside of this mitten and it'll just make the most beautiful cushy liner. Yeah. What a good idea taking. So this was a UFO that you had languishing and you took it with you and yes, blah, you got okay. it done. Yep. And then same thing with these socks. I managed to finish these. These were a pair of socks that were in my knitting bag forever. And um, I managed to finish them off during watching football games in the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> that looks like earth yarns. It is earth yarns. Yeah, this was a single. A little tough to knit, though. The strands kept coming apart, I oh. found. Yeah, but I, I progressed. Yeah, yeah. I kept That's going. Good. Persevered. <laughs> That's earth spelled U-R-T-H. They kind of have a distinctive striping um, sensibility. Don't they? Yeah. yeah. I think you can kind of tell an earth yarn from... From a distance. Other yarns. I find too, yeah, some of the striping sequences are similar throughout the different color ranges. But speaking of striping yarns, that's another thing that we have coming up on this episode of Podcast On. It's an interview with Catherine Gamroth from Gage Dye Works. Uh, so we're going to talk to a striping dyer about her color choices and her method and how she got into the business, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really that's really nice. So stay tuned for that as well, an interview with Catherine. Wasn't that fun? We met her at Knit City and got to spend some time with her. And um, you picked up some of her yarn, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, well, so in the, in the interview, you'll see a sweater that I uh, knit, again, in an Ann Bud class, uh, that uses her self-striping shawl yarn in the yoke of the sweater. So uh, I'll, 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 make, I'll make you all wait to see that one for the interview. Good. And what do you have behind you? Oh, well, behind me is just, you know, is just backdrop. Uh, but, um, but I do have some things to share. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Let's see what you've been so, up to. First of all, I wanted to know if you noticed my jingle bell necklace it's been you know flashing away here uh it does it does better when it's darker in the room but your uh, hair was covering it before so that's why i didn't notice it <laughs> that's so cute and festive i love it you know uh when we do these when we do these shoots you always make me wear something christmassy so i just naturally got up this morning and put on the jingle bell necklace knowing that we were can you do a little jingle for us too there we go <laughs> so um, we just finished up a class with Sarah Shira from Imagined Landscapes, and she did her no fun like gnome fun class, but she did it Santa style. And so oh. I finished off my little Santa gnome. He's uh, he's got a round belly and black boots, and you know his little Santa beard and his big bulby nose you know, in his little hat. And so this was a three hour class with Sarah Shira. Not like maybe, you know, maybe one of us besides Sarah got it done in the three hours, but uh, the rest of us, you know, just watched the recording a little bit later and, uh, and finished off our Santa. So I'm really, oh my gosh, my how husband. cute. Right. So did you have fun making them? When I saw it last, you just, you had the hat and I think some arms, maybe a beard done. Yeah. Oh no. He's he like. I mean, it takes it takes so little time to make this tiny gnome. Uh, it's it it's a it's a ton of fun. And I used some really nice Australian wool uh, for my Santa. So, um, so he's he's really soft and merino. He's merino soft and very squishy. So yes, I had a I had a great time doing that. And then uh, while you were away, I did a Vogue knitting uh, marketplace presentation and I started to make a Jolly Juniper tree. And so I had to finish that. And so, oh my gosh, this, this is a Jolly Juniper tree on the, in the Vogue presentation. I said, this is, you know, one of our best selling patterns. And, um, 
So I just had to, you know, create myself a little Santa gnome yes. and uh, Christmas tree. I just happened to have some sparkly tinsel yarn left over from something or other, Barb. And so mm -hmm. that's what it went into. Um, that's so, so my, cute. <laughs> those are my finished objects. And then right behind me here, I think you might see one more gnome. Or, well, three gnomes, actually. Yeah. Uh, it was a Christmas present from our friend Diane. Uh Diane Ross, uh, she's part of our Makers Meetup, like your friend Elaine, who met you in Texas. And so she gifted me uh, these gnomes for a uh, Christmas present. Was it? Oh my so gosh. Awesome. I've got to see those. you got to pull them out. And let's have a look at them. I, I will. I will. I'm kind of saving them for Monday night, but I will be oh, closer. Okay. Yeah. She brought us something else, Barb. Uh, every year, Bar uh, Diane's been giving us something special from a local distillery and so this is a coffee enhancer from Hansen uh, distillery yeah cheers and uh, I have to admit I did taste test it <laughs> and to make sure that it was you know it that was it on par. sharing so um, that's <laughs> I will so nice. I'll pass it I'll pass it over to you to uh to have a to have a sip um, maybe we can meet in a coffee shop and I'll bring a little flask. <laughs> there you go. Love that. And then lastly, I i don't know if I told you about this or not, but I had knit this sweater for Hayden. You know, this is the yes. iceberg sweater from uh, Newfoundland Knits for Little Ones. And yes. The sleeves were too tight. And don't you know it? If you're eight... And you're wearing a sweater that your Omi knit for you, and the sleeves are too tight. It's just a little bit itchy, Omi. Yes. So I took the sweater back, and I made the sleeves wider, and I ran out of yarn. So I had to, um, I had to use a bit of the yarn here, a little improv improvisation. Yeah, yeah. So I think that looks pretty cool. And, looks great. Uh, it's probably like, you know, dinosaur arms for an eight-year-old. or <laughs> The 10-year-old uh, sweater that I made for his big sister is also uh, under deconstruction. So basically what I did was snip a stitch uh, up here at the arm, and I removed the arm uh, and then um, unraveled the yarn, uh, put it into a hank, washed it to get the kinks out, and then I'm re knitting him to sleeves. But you know, which might sound like a lot of work, but not as not nearly as much work as knitting a sweater that no one will wear because exactly. the arms are too tight and yeah. you know or too itchy or too itchy. Yeah, yeah. So uh, those will be re gifted back to the kids uh, in a in a week or two, and maybe it'll go. I'll come along with a long sleeved t shirt to wear underneath. I have a hard time, you know, believing that the the superwash merino wool is too itchy, but it is. It is the time of year when our skin is very dry and super sensitive to yeah. everything. So, uh, so there may be. I'm just really impressed that he told you that was too itchy and. <laughs> You listened and changed it for him because it's so important, right? Yeah. Even little yeah. ones have sensitive skin. And, and yeah. you know, what else is important is the advice that Katie gave us. Katie Noseworthy is the author of the book, Newfoundland Knits for Little Ones. And she said to us at the beginning of our project with her, uh, you should ask kids if they would like something. Don't just go ahead and knit them something, give it to them and expect them to be all excited about it. You need yeah. to ask them and you need to involve them in the process. And so that's right. I mean, Remember how many mums and grandmas we had coming into the store who brought their little ones with them and they were part of the selection yeah. of the yarn and the colors and yeah. Yeah. So that's that's kind of my little stack of uh, whips and uh, finished objects. So I'll bring the other gnome over closer. Oh my gosh, you have a big one! Yeah, yeah, he is. He, he's as big as my head, and then some. Yeah. Uh, so I think this was maybe last year's mystery gnome. I I know he's got a name. Uh, I just can't remember what it is. And I made one of those big ones too. He also gave me a little. Um, 
Noah and Naomi uh, gnomes. So these are, this is the pattern that Sarah Shira uses for her no fun, like gnome fun class. And yeah. uh, so I've got two gnomes in the same uh, colors as this guy. So they're going to, uh, they're going to hang out on my shelf here indefinitely. And while I'm at it, just one more thing. Diane also gave me a pair of Queen Vicky's wristlets. And Diane is another, she's a fellow machine knitter. And so I believe she did these on her knitting machine. Wow. And look how nice those are. They're beautiful. Right? So I really lucked out uh, with really? that because I, because I still have the, you know, the coffee enhancer at my house as well. So <laughs> hey, <Nice. friends. laughs> that's great. So we're going to get to see those again tonight because we meet up with our Monday night group. Right. And maybe we'll have more unveilings. That's right. That's right. Uh, there were there were also perhaps some cookies and some uh, handmade chocolates, but uh, those are uh, nowhere to be seen now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did really. She did really well. That's amazing. Uh, I, it was amazing. It was totally amazing. So that is uh, <laughs> that is kind of what's on the needles here. I do want to mention as well that we have some classes coming up this month. So between now and the end of the year, uh, we have some great classes. Um, one of them, you're teaching. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I wanted to teach something that could help people make a quick gift before Christmas. So I've got Thrumish mittens. No, hat. Thrumish hat class coming up. Yeah. 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 So really briefly, Barb, what is a Thrumish hat? It's kind of, well, you know, thrummed mittens, hat, socks are kind of a Newfoundland thing mm -hmm. and Nova Scotia thing. And we have been making them for years and years and years. They're where you put wool roving stuffed inside your mitten or your hat to keep your ears and fingers really warm but they take a long long time to make you have to make each thrum individually so we chat in our chats with kate atherley we asked her if there was a faster way to do it and she said absolutely and she designed us a pattern a set of patterns actually for a hat and mitten combo where you use a chunky yarn on the inside and you strand it and knit it in a way that, prov that makes those sort of V-shaped thrums on the public side of the work. And so I'm going to teach a workshop on how you do that. Yeah, and you can make great. that, yeah, a yeah. hat for, you know, everyone in your family. We're going to do a little one for a baby just to speed things up in the class, but you can make them as big or as large as you want. So uh, this is uh, thrumish. It might look a little bit like stranded knitting, but it is not stranded color work, correct? Well, no. I mean, uh, I suppose you could hold one strand in each hand and knit that way. I have knit that way. But um, there's no, I don't think there's any need to carry or to weave in your ends along the back, you can leave your strands hanging. So it's just a slightly different technique. And, and then I have a special way of wrapping the yarns around my needle to have that thrum show up on the public side in a nice uh, V. Yeah. And speaking of Kate Atherley, she's also teaching a class this month on a gentle introduction to Fair Isle. So nice. if we're interested in doing stranded color work, which is using two colors per row. Sometimes you hold them in your right hand. Sometimes you hold them in your left hand. You might hold one color in each hand. Um, Kate's going to show everyone how to manage the yarns and how to read a chart uh, so that you can give a try of doing some color work in this particular method. We yeah, that's a little bit stressed about it because sometimes, you know, you can end up with something that's kind of puckered uh, or maybe something that is... Mm, you know, where your yarns get tangled up and you're not sure, do I do this or do I do this? Or, you know, just how do I do this? So 
Kate's class is called A Gentle Introduction to Fair Isle, and that's exactly what it is. And we'll be uh, gifting everyone who takes that class with one of her patterns that she designed exclusively for us called uh, Not Flying. It's a hat and mitten kit that is um, something kit, a hat and mitten pattern that is a nice way to practice those skills uh, once you've learned them. So that's kind and of And worsted cool. weight too, right, Cynthia, which most people will have in their stash. Absolutely. A nice size of needle to be if you're if it's your first time knitting ferrile, it's nice to do it on a thicker yarn and a bigger needle. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it can be scary a little bit. But Kate yeah. is so nice. She's such got such a great style. I think everyone will love her class. Yeah. And then uh, I'm wearing a sweater by Bristol Ivy today. This one is called the Offshore V-neck, and it's a cabled sweater. But I'm wearing it because I'm really excited about a class that's coming up this weekend with Bristol Ivy. This one's called From the Top, Exploring Top-Down Shawls. And so, again, like I'm excited for a couple of reasons. One is because she's going to explain how you can alter the shape of a shawl when you work from the top down she's going to give us some you know traditional formulas to kind of follow and practice with and then she's going to talk to us about altering them and I just think you know you know it's it's going to be a fun kind of exploration but also you know how many of us have like that skein or two of lace or fingering weight yarn that's just kind of kicking around in your stash with no 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 project attached to it and and i love the way that bristol kind of taps into your creativity um in in the sense that she's going to say you know you can just follow this just keep doing this and you're going to end up with something that is beautiful and pretty and your own creation so i really feel like that's um motivating and fun especially at this time of year you know if you just want to do something from your own head uh yeah you can. but even if you don't if you want to follow a pattern because bristol has beautiful top-down shawl patterns as well as sweaters uh you can as well you know follow one of her patterns and um and it makes more sense because now you understand the construction and how it's all supposed yeah. to work yeah remember you and i took a class from bristol mm-hmm. on shawl shapes back in before COVID, I'm sure. <laughs> well, it's of, great. Yeah, it's part of her book, too. Uh, Bristol has a book um, called uh, Out, of, Out of the Box. Uh, yeah, I I'll, think that's it. I'll, I'll grab it off my shelf and, and I'll put a picture in here for you. But that also explores shell shape. So she's really knowledgeable. But she's also a lot of fun. And I just think that, and again, it's not just Bristol. You know, Kate's a lot of fun and you're a lot of fun. Because when you take these classes, you're going to be engaged. And I think Mm -hmm. that's key to learning and to, um, you know, putting a little trust in yourself that this is going to work out. And if it doesn't, uh, you're just inventing something new. That's right. Yeah. (laughs) Crystal's very mathematical, too, and she's got such a great way of explaining things. I think she helps you build confidence in your ability to come up with your own Mm -hmm. shawl shape, whether you want it long and and narrow or triangular or whatever shape you want. That's right. And if you're in, well, not if you're in the spirit of learning, but one last thing that we're going to do before we break for the holidays is have a fiber side chat with an Irish, uh, with a with a lovely Irish person named Vaughn Corrigan, and she's written two books on Irish knitting, specifically on Aran knits and let me just look here, right, Irish Aran and Irish tweed. Uh, so she's going to talk to us about the um, the traditions and the patterning and the hmm, the knitting history that comes from Ireland I think that's going to be really exciting and fun so I bet she's got an incredible accent (laughs) I bet she does as well yeah so um excuse me so come and join us uh, at Fibersight Chats as well 
and uh, you'll have your December just kind of all all in the bag. Yep. All right. Well, we we will be back before the end of the year. We always do a little, you know, end of year kind of wrap up uh, for podcast on. So there will be, a, you know, a Christmas edition that comes out a little bit later this month. Um, but until then, friends, uh, we hope that you are um, safe and happy and warm and that you are uh, that you have something on the hook or on the needles that you are enjoying. Maybe it's on the frame if you're working on a weaving project or on the wheel yeah. if you're spinning. Uh, <clears throat> we love we love all the crafts, and we'd love to have you come and join us for our makers meetup, which is on Mondays. Uh, information is on our website, and uh, we'd love to have you join us there as well. Mm -hmm. so take care, everyone, and stay on for the uh, the the video tour of McKinney Knittery and our, our lovely chat with Catherine Gamroth. From Gage Dye Works, yes. Striping yarn. See you soon. Hello, Ginger. Good morning. Thank you so much for inviting me here to your shop. Happy uh, to have you here. Yeah, this is so great. So we're in McKinney. Yes. How long have you been here? Uh, the shop has been in downtown McKinney yeah. since 2015. We opened as a yarn store in a boutique mall, tiny little uh, bit of wall space, and we grew from there to um, a, a little bit bigger space, then a little bit bigger, and now this is our current space. Wow. We've got uh, about 3,500 square feet of retail space. Mm -hmm. um, this space was big enough that we added fabric. So, wow. So we're half yarn shop, half uh, fabric store. And the colors in here, it's, it just, as soon as I walked in, it just has such a beautiful feeling. Um, I'm sure that's something that you were trying to yes. uh, establish here yes. in the community. We have people that come in that don't know anything about knitting or sewing, mm -hmm. but they just want to see the colors. Yeah. And it's, it's just fabulous. You've got a great community. My friend Elaine is a customer of yours and she highly recommended your shop. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. So what's, tell me if you had to pick one or two of your yarns that were, you know, kind of the, the standouts for you. Yeah. Um, what would you say? Well, I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to show you two. Okay. One of them we've had for a long time and one of them is fairly new to the shop. Fantastic. So the new one is right here. This is Plucky. Wow. And okay. we have um, one, two, three, four, five, six bases, I believe, from them. Wow. They um, incredible yarn, uh, great colors, and uh, they've been just so awesome to work with. I, I, as soon as we get space, you know, we'll just keep adding bases because they, they really are exceptional. No. Um, this is a swatch with them, which of course you can't feel, but I will just tell you, it feels wonderful. Wow. This is their Lux Merino. We have it in sport and in worsted. Nice. So the first time I ever heard of Plucky Knitters was when I went to Church Mouse Yarns and Teas in Bainbridge Island. Yes. Um, so same dyer. And well, now um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure that when in the process that would have been, but Sarah doesn't own them anymore. Oh, okay. uh, but she has opened a shop in Bainbridge Island called oh. The Lamb and Kid, okay. um, which is definitely worth a visit. All right. We just might have to go there. Yes, yes. And she's got all sorts of new fun yarns there. 
uh, but not the not the plucky yarns. Nice. So this is this is the newcomer to the shop that okay. we love. It's a great one for up front here Let's with all the colors. Let's go ahead and, okay. and just give us. This a is quick... the Terra DK, awesome garment yarn. Then this is their Primo fingering. Uh, merino cashmere nylon and it's got um i believe 20 percent cashmere yes so it's it's it really nice nobody nice. complains about touching that yarn yeah <laughs> and we've got the mohair silk and the surrey silk oh uh, and the worsted um over here well i'm a bit of a sucker for mohair are you oh just yes it's popular now There's for sure thing about it just love it the colors are so vibrant, aren't they? They, they really are. Wow. And we we will always have a lot of pink. It's my favorite color, so you'll see <laughs> you'll see probably a little bit more than the normal amount of pink here. Fantastic. Then the one that we've had for so long is Magpie. Yeah. Uh, Magpie Fibers. She is a hand dyer out of Frederick, Maryland, and um, I fell you... in, I fell in love with her yarns at a show, and I I pestered her until she finally gave in. I thought, I'm just going to keep sending her emails until she um, files a restraining order. <laughs> but thankfully, we got the yarn before the restraining order. So um, her, their big base is their swanky. Uh, it's a merino cashmere nylon. They've got swanky sock and swanky DK. All right. So, and we've added, we've added other bases. Uh, the swanky sock is from the midpoint here coming forward all the way here through. And then the same colors on the back side in the DK. Wow. Colors are awesome. The feel is awesome. Uh, we've added her bulky. I just have to get back here yep. and just show you some of this beautiful furniture that Ginger has too. It's The shop is just decorated so beautifully. <laughs> this hat was made with the bulky Wow. that, oh, yes. um, that Magpie has in all their colors and of course you can you can imagine this is my favorite <laughs> <laughs> that's you it is me yes uh we've got their mohair blend and then over here this is their equinox base sorry i'm getting ahead of you oh and they have a line of mohair as well yes of course oh what a beautiful palette you know that's it's uh they've got a lot of other colors in there too. It's almost, it's almost like a purpley gray. Mm -hmm. Wow. So this is their Equinox base. This one's a fairly new one for them. Uh, perfect for our climate. It's 65% silk, 35% linen. Oh, and nice. so these are the colors back here. I've seen it made into garments. I haven't got to make one yet, but it is on the list. So this would be a nice Texas summertime warm weather fiber, yes. wouldn't it? Yes, absolutely. Gorgeous colors. Equinox. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. This is a beautiful area. Yes, yes. Uh, we love this area. This, uh, this was important to us when we moved into this space, that we had a spot that was always available. Mm -hmm. The space we were in before this was uh, smaller. We had one table. So that was for classes. That was for people that came in that needed help. Yeah. That was for people to come in and knit. Uh, but here, we don't have to worry about scheduling around anything because this is always available. Uh, and I can't see it on the camera, but straight above, this used to be, so this building was built uh, around the turn of the century, 1899, 1900. And this was a skylight which was not a very smart thing for Texas. We get a lot of hail, oh. so there was a lot of water damage. Mm -hmm. um, so at some point a long time ago, they got wise and they closed that in, but we wanted to keep the, the look of it. Yes. So um, in Texas in the porches, they use this blue color. Uh, oh. it's, a, it's a traditional thing. There's, I've heard a few different reasons why. I don't know what the, what the truth is. Mm -hmm. um, so when we hung the chandelier, chandelier here and it's just a great place for people to meet. People have made friends here. People get help here. Everyone's really good about welcoming uh, the new folks and welcoming those that might need some help. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, we're available to help as well. Uh, Monday through Thursday, we stay open late till 8 and we have uh, knit together from six to eight, yes. and they all have a different host, so they have a different feel, and um, you know, people, they're their own little groupies for those nights. Tuesday evenings, we have a group of, of 20s and 30s somethings, mm -hmm. um, and even some teenagers. Very and nice. they have, to, that's the biggest group. 
they have to bring in lots of, of extra chairs so everyone has a place to sit and um, it's it's just it's been a great great place how many years have you been here ginger now in this location yeah okay we've been in downtown mckinney since 2015 we've been in this location since july of 2020. So we started renovating the building in November of 2019. Just before the pandemic. Just before, yes. <laughs> surprise, you know, surprise. Right, yeah. There's not too much you can do about that, right? No. You have to make the best of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it's, this shop has just such a lovely feel. I congratulate you Thank on you. being here in this community. I think your customers must really love it. What do you say, oh, ladies? They, do you like they, this shop? Yeah. <laughs> It's perfect. The, the customers and the, the staff are a big part of that that community feeling. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for having us here today. Absolutely. Really Absolutely. Now, if people wanted to get a hold of you or or order from you, have you got an online shop we do. as well? We do. McKinneyKnittery.com or DowntownDryGoods.com. Both of them will take you to the, the online section of our website. Excellent. We'll put There's a also a little video of the shop on there, too, if someone wants to see a little more. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Well, hello, Barb, and hello, Catherine. It's really nice hello. to have you here with us today. Uh, Barb and I are visiting with Catherine from Gage Dye Works. Uh, we were in Knit City, Vancouver. We've been to Knit City, Vancouver a lot. Barb, would you agree? It's uh, it's kind of a place where we like to go. And um, we were there this, this uh, fall. <laughs> Spring as well. <laughs> Spring. <Yeah. laughs> oh man. <laughs> we traveled a lot this year, Catherine. We, we went to Knit City in Montreal too. Right. So that was a lot of fun as well. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, yeah, we just got home from Knit City, Vancouver, where we saw your beautiful display of yarn. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so uh, Barb and I have been fans for a long time. We've uh, we've we've purchased uh, a fair bit of yarn, and usually it's at Knit City Vancouver. But more recently, it's been online through your online store. And so I have to I have to tell you, Catherine, I like your online store. It's really easy to spend money there. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. That's good to hear. The photography is really good, but I, I think probably what is most compelling or interesting about what you do to me as a consumer is is the way that you dye your yarn. Uh, I feel like you've always kind of been known as this, you know, in, inventive person who's come up with these great ways to dye yarn so that they come out in a specific sequence. So behind me here... Um, I have a sweater that I knit, and we, we run classes with Ann Bud. They're all on top-down sweaters, and this was a recent one where, so the sweater's my own design, and I took um, a skein that I had purchased from you of your shawl striping yarn, and I used that in the yoke, you know, starting with the smallest stripe at the top and working down through the uh, through the yoke. 
And then I transitioned it into a solid yarn uh, at the bottom, well, a bit at the top and again at the bottom, uh, to create a self-striping yoke for me. Now, you've actually come up with self-striping yoke yarns as well, or sweater yarns, and we'll talk about that. But I, I just thought, what a, it, it just fascinates me how you do this. And um, maybe before we, we get into, you know, kind of your history and that sort of thing, I'll, I'll turn the, the camera over to Barb, because I think, Barb, you went through your stash today and you were going through your yarns. You want to show us what you uh, what you got? Yeah. Um, I always say that, you know, when I buy souvenir yarn, it doesn't count. <laughs> it's, it's in the stash. And uh, I have some really old souvenir yarn. Catherine, do you even remember this? I do, but that's going way back. Yeah, I know it's it's going way way back, and uh, and I'm going to be working with this one next. Uh, this one was called Fade to Black, and gosh, this must be I want to say like 2012 or 14 or something. It Maybe. must be. It was after we made the switch because we were Caterpillar Green and then um, rebranded as Gage, but that must have been one of the early um gauge ball bands that you've got there yeah you would know by the marketing wouldn't you the, the ball band but this one is so fascinating to me it's called fade to black and i want to team it with black black and mm. make something with it so yeah we're really excited to to hear your story how, how did you get into all of this and how long has it been and i've got a million questions so <laughs> Tell us, tell us this, the history, how you got, how did you, have you always wanted to dye yarn or is this something that just happened or? Um, so I started, I've done like crafts my whole life um, oh. and got into crocheting before I got into knitting. So um, my college years were just like a series of crocheted hats for, I think everyone I know. And looking back now, I always did stripes. I think just to keep it interesting for myself, probably. Mm -hmm. um, and then I tried knitting a few times, but it finally stuck maybe 15 years ago now. Um, so got into knitting and then discovered self-striping yarn. And then somewhere saw a tutorial for how to dye it. And if you're doing it by hand, it is incredibly labor intensive. Mm -hmm. um, and my husband and I both have a background in engineering and we sort of looked at this and like, there's got to be a better way. Like there's got to be a way to do this that doesn't involve, I don't know if you've seen the tutorials, but like the, the most straightforward way is you put a chair here and then maybe 40 feet away, you put another chair and then you walk. So if your skein is 400 meters long, you walk 400 meters to wrap the skein around two chairs and then you dye different sections, different colors. And then you put it back on the chairs and walk another 400 meters um, to wind it back into a ball. Um, and My daughter has done that in a small, you know, 700 square foot home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then all she had a bunch of little jars with different colors in it. Yes. Is that the process? Yeah. yeah. So it's we saw crazy. that and we thought, well, there's no way Regia or Knit Picks is doing it that way when they produce on a mass scale, there is just no way they're paying people to, even if you have a, a warping loom, I think what, what weavers would use, you can use that to get that big loop. Um, anyway, so we, we just thought there's gotta be, there's gotta be a better way. Um, so that was the start was just kind of a fun, um, not as a business idea, but just as a surely, like surely we could do this differently. As a challenge to your engineering backgrounds. Yeah. Yeah. And we found out that, that sure enough, you can, but it was, it was a lot, a lot more work than we expected. But um, we also realized we could do like the traditional way you dye self-striping yarn. You need your colors to repeat. However big your, your loop is at the beginning, that's how frequently you're going to repeat colors. Because when you're putting each section in a pot of dye, you come back to the green you know, every four times around. Um, and the way we came up with to dye involves, we just sort of pull the yarn off. We work off big cones, pull the yarn off the cone and kind of dye it as we go and realize we don't actually have to have those repeats um, oh. the way you normally do. So it means we can 
where's my best example here? It means we can just have a scheme that starts here. And even though there's gray in it more than once, it actually never does the same thing twice. So we we came up with a whole other system, which has its own challenges and frustrations, but um, but just gave us a lot of flexibility in how we could diet and automates a lot of it so that, um, I mean, the other challenge with self-striping yarn is how you how you can sell it and not charge $300 a skein. Right. right. Um, in the same way that it's really hard to have a business knitting and then selling your knitwear because it's hard to get paid what your time is worth. I think self-striping yarn falls in that category as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got um, some things automated so that it's, um, we built it ahead of time and that's where our time went. Um, so that day to day, uh, I have time to like run the rest of the business, not just do the dyeing. Yeah. And do you have a whole team, Catherine? I imagine that you've got a whole crew that, you know, works on your production. And um, we have, so my husband and I both, um, we are Gage. Um, and as of a few years ago, this is my husband's main job. For a while, he was desperately trying to divide his time um, three ways, actually. Um, so now that's our, um, our family's primary source of income is Gage. And we have one um, part-time assistant um, who does uh, twists the yarn and labels it and does all the shipping. So that's that's who we are. Wow, that's a very small business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow, that's great. And Catherine, you're located on Vancouver Island. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're in Victoria. Right. Have you always lived there? No, I uh, I was born in Thunder Bay, Ontario, uh, and moved out to Vancouver when I was in high school, and then went to university at UVic, and um, kind of been back and forth between Vancouver and Victoria uh, since. So we realized actually that, um, so our family just moved from one house to another house over the summer, but realized the house we just left. I had lived there longer than I had lived anywhere else in my life, which makes sense, but didn't feel right. You know, the house you grew up in as a kid is like where you're from. But um, yeah, so I, I have lived my adult life in Victoria, I guess. And do you find uh, sometimes dyers tell us that part of, you know, what is a complexity of dyeing is is the water, you know, the the kind of water that you use, the and the changing nature of the water over the course of the seasons. Do you, do you find that as well? Oh, we do. And so we use, for actually mixing up dye, we use distilled water. Um, because exactly, it's there's just too many. Um, so I have a science background and I'm constant, but, um, but I'm constantly frustrated at how much it's not a science, it is an art or how much, you know, because the the exact pH and the exact temperature that you're working at really do matter. Um, so, yeah, distilled water. Any 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 source of um, surprise that we can get rid of, we do. Yeah. The other thing I've noticed about your your yarns, and maybe this has to do with the, you know, the process that you and your husband use. But in a lot of self-striping yarns, you'll get that crossover where, where you know, you've changed from one color to the next color. And maybe that's, you know, like Barb is describing, if you're putting it in pots, the dyes are going to cross over. So there's, but but if you look at the sweater behind me, I feel like there's like a very clear line where the color changes. There's no um, bleeding from one color to the next. Is that, do you think that's a, you know, part of, you know, what makes you different? Um, yes and no. I think that is, um, that is certainly something we struggle with because you don't want to leave a white gap between those two colors. Um, and as soon as they touch, they're going to wick before the dye has set. Um, you want the yarn to suck up that dye. You just want it to only suck up to the left over here and only to the right over here. Um, so, so on that example behind you, I think maybe what helps is the colors are kind of in rainbow order. 
So if there is a bit of, if there is a slower transition, you don't notice because it was going from green to a different green. Um, but it is something if I'm going from like green to purple, there's going to be a little bit of brown in the middle because that's what's between green and purple. Um, so we really try hard to minimize a third color kind of appearing. Um, but yeah, that's that is that is a thing you see with self-striping yarn for sure. Yeah. That's got to be a challenge, hey? Because like, when you're picking colors, if you want a specific sequence, then, you know, putting, putting like you say, you know, putting um what was it red and no blue and purple i mean yeah you, you you're maybe picking colors in a in a way that minimizes that color change perhaps mm -hmm. yeah that is something that i for sure keep in mind yeah let's talk about color for a second <clears throat> how do you um how do you think about color what are your thoughts when you're going into your planning and you know, um, what inspires you when it comes to color? So I am someone who, um, you know, some people have like a very clear sense of style. Like you can just, even if you don't see their face, you know, it's them because, because they always wear hot pink or they always, their house is just an extension of, and I am the opposite. I just, I like everything a little bit and I enjoy novelty I think more than consistency maybe or something or maybe I'm just um get overwhelmed with choice so like I have a a gray couch you know rather than going for a, a, a emerald green couch like part of me kind of wants um so I don't feel like I have um a very like personal sense of style or color um, but I think my work does. Um, and part of that is because we use, we actually only use four primary colors when we dye. We use oh. the same as your like office printer would, would a CMYK. So cyan, which is like that bright blue magenta, which is like a hot pink, yellow, and then black. Um, so there's a lot of colors you can make with that, but not all the colors there's a lot of like deep beautiful reds that we really have trouble with um so i think my work ends up having a fairly recognizable palette um because because of the choices we made up front with what colors we're starting with mm -hmm. well isn't that interesting so in a way that that's kind of freeing isn't it you really only have to think about four <laughs> colors <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and it is a way of it is it just does simplify things mm -hmm. um but also does mean there are times when i feel like everything i do looks the same what if i wanted to do something different today uh, and it one of the nice things about dyeing self striping yarn is it means when i go to somewhere like knit city and decide to go shopping um i i don't do any of that for the most part so i i can i can shop around and it's, I often find myself, the colors that I don't dye, like lots of reds and stuff, I don't, it, are the things I end up buying from other people. Yeah. So you're drawn to some of the things that are different from what you do. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, are there kind of tried and true things that you've done with your palette that you love to repeat over and over? Uh, rainbows for sure. Okay. Um, one of the first that actually that colorway I held up earlier, this like alternating gray and rainbow stripes, um, was one of the first colorways I ever developed, which was 10 years ago. Um, so I was our first little fiber festival, the first sale we ever made. I was pregnant at the time which makes it really easy for me to remember how old our company is because my son is about to have his 10th birthday. So that was 10 years ago. Wow. Um, so this was one of the colorways we had with us that first day 10 years ago. Um, and it's still one of our customers' favorites because people, wow. people just like color. And that's why they come to us, I think, is they want color. Um, but not everyone wants like as an alternative, we have some really like out there neon bright, you know, this type of thing. 
Um, and some people love that and might wear it for socks, but wouldn't necessarily wear it uh, around their face. Um, so this has always been popular, but I do come back to just throwing a whole rainbow at it um, quite often. Normally not on purpose. I keep trying to uh, minimize and pull back and then and then adding just one one thing back in. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's go back to that hat uh, that you just showed us, Catherine, for a minute, mm-hmm. because I think that if I recall correctly from your website, this is like a new kind of dyeing process that you're experimenting with. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So this, this hat, um, and this is the full skein, this, um, I can't do speckles. This is one of the things that just our process doesn't allow me to do because from my understanding with speckles, you, um, so the dye I work with acid dye starts as a powder and you mix it into a, a liquid and then, um, put the yarn in, in the water. Um, whereas speckles, I think you take like the powder and just throw it at the yarn I can't do that um so I've been working on different ways to have that variegation um and kind of a um that random but still sort of cohesive look uh so we that and this one folds into a muscle brick hat so this particular colorway uh was actually for our club last year um, so this hasn't been in our website yet. This was just people who signed up for our winter club. Um, and if I can go off on a little tangent here, this one, um, the theme for our club was the people in the club. Um, so we asked people to fill out a little form telling us their favorite colors, uh, and then came up with, um, as many of those, uh, as we could, and then just kind of put them all, put them all in there. Um, so you can see there's more, like there's less yellow and there's more blues and teals and greens um, because more people have blues and greens and teals as one of their favorite colors. Uh, but what I did with this, um, I had done a big color swatch with all of people's favorite colors or as many as I could manage um, and then kind of threw it all into this one. Um, but then I had that swatch lying on my desk. And my husband walked by one day and looked at it and was like, well, that's a colorway right there. And so that's what, what this one is. Wow. That's two socks. Um, so this we have just as a product now, and it's called 76 because there's 76 stripes. Um, but this one just started as the swatch for the other project. That's so cool. Was there a mathematical equation that you you had to analyze all that data? Uh, oh, absolutely. Yes, this is <laughs> this is what I do. Um, and well, actually, for the all the data of just people submitting their telling us their favorite colors, I just put it all in a big spreadsheet and then tried to group it into um, color families. Which like, well, is peach? Is that orange? Is that pink? So there, you know, a little bit of judgment um, to be had there. But then I looked at, um, like I did make myself a little pie chart with what percentage was what color so that I could get the um, the, per- the percentages, right, the proportions right for the, for the hat. Yeah. But there is a lot of pre-planning to dye self-striping yarn because before you start at the beginning, you need to know how much of everything um, you need to fit on one skein. Right. Well, and some of your skeins are really large too. Is is that have to do with the striping sequence that you're going through? Yeah. So we have like the regular size skein and then we have one that's one and a half times. Um, Well, partly because we can. I think a lot of dyers buy their yarn pre-skeined. So they they go with the size they've got. Um, we have to work off a cone that's, they're usually one kilogram cones. So like eight to 10 skeins worth of yarn. I should have had one. They're, they're like this they're big. giant. Yeah. yeah. Um, so partly the reason we have the largest skeins is just because we can. Um, but the other reason is we started dyeing this shawl yarn. And sometimes you just want a, a bit of a bigger shawl. Mm-hmm. Um, and the only reason I don't go bigger than that is 
uh, it just becomes such a mess for winding. Um, the thought of sending someone like 1200 yards of yarn in one big skein is just like, it's going to fall off the swift and they're never going to recover and it's going to be a disaster. So if we need, yep. we do have a few products that are that much, maybe not quite that much yarn. We do have a few larger products and we just split it into two skeins and sell you a two skein kit um, just because it it's just unmanageable. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, I just want to go back a little bit, um, Catherine. You know, you said you started, uh, was it 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm sure that your business took off because 10 years ago, there weren't that many people doing self-striping yarns, at least not the way that you were doing it. But then COVID hit. What mm -hmm. happened? What happened then for you? What was yeah, that? So Oh, sorry. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, you're quite right. When we started, we were we were lucky to start when we did, for sure. Um, because self self striping yarns, um, you sort of had to wait for that dyer to to list stuff and then snap it up immediately. And if you didn't get it that day, you had to wait till next week or two weeks later. Um, uh, so we were we were so lucky with COVID that we already had like we rent a commercial space. Um, so we already had a safe space that was just us outside of the house. And we had an online business when COVID hit. So we were already really well set up that we could go into work. We knew we were safe. Um, our customers already knew how to find us online. Um, yeah. So um, getting a hold of our raw materials was the challenge for us during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but in we we were really lucky we did manage a few things changed and we're actually this this year we're actually making a lot of changes that i think trace back to supply chain issues that happened during covid that haven't bounced back yet or that have just changed um so we're sourcing a bunch of stuff from new suppliers now i think as a result of changes that happened during covid but um, but I think I think we were lucky that people who would normally travel to see their grandkids bought yarn and put all their love and all their good wishes for their grandkids into sweaters and into hats and into socks and put it in the mail. Um, so I, I think people were home doing a lot of knitting during COVID. Yes. Yeah, we saw that, too. Um, I think you know, people really wanted an outlet because they were stuck at home. Mm -hmm. And so their crafting and their making became very, very important. Cynthia and I started hosting classes and, and make-alongs during that time via Zoom because everybody was on Zoom. And that was really appreciated as well. Which which yeah. kind of takes me to my question. I, I noticed, uh, Catherine, and maybe you've been doing this all along. But I noticed more recently that you've been doing some collaborations with other people. Um, I came across you again, you know, with the solar system yarn, because we were we were doing a class with Holly Yo. She was teaching tiptoe up socks and she showed us her solar system socks. And I think the entire class went and ordered the yarn from your website after that, because it's so cool. So, you know, how... How do these collaborations come about? Are there, you know, some interesting stories behind, you know, what you're up to these days in terms of bringing other designers and other people into kind of into working with Gage Dye Works? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am. Um, I think every every collaboration or every connection I've ever had has come either through Knit City. I met Holly at Knit City um, or through, you know, random connections on Instagram. Um, but Knit City, really, I have two times a year I get to see people who have either the same job I have or who have a job like being a knitwear designer. Um, so I had met Holly maybe my second year at Knit City. Her booth backed on to mine. Um, and I believe she was carrying some of your yarns from River City, River City Yarns. I said that out loud and that sounds wrong. Yeah, um, that, that year as well. So I may have even seen you that year in passing anyway um and holly had a whole series of patterns from earlier in her career working specifically with self-striping yarns 
Um, so that always seemed like a good a good fit. And the way we've worked together hasn't been that she has taken my yarn and designed a pattern. It's more been me taking my yarn and saying, oh, that might actually work well with this pattern you already have, Holly. Uh, and when I'm going to hold up, so these, you mentioned the solar system. Um, so this, the, the colorway is, is the solar system. This is the sun at the top and then all the planets, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, all the way down. Yeah, I think I got that right. Um, and I knew that, um, I wanted specifically to knit it toe up because then um, then you have control. You can make the foot the right size for your foot, but then you can keep knitting until you run out of yarn if you want to get all the planets there. So I knew I wanted a toe up sock. Uh, and it's hard to find patterns that are just very straightforward because designers always want to add their own flair and they want to make sure their pattern stands out in some way. Um, whereas Holly has these beautiful, simple patterns that I believe she wrote maybe at your request because she wanted to use them in classes. Um, so it seemed perfect that she already had a pattern that shows you exactly how to do this. Um, and she was kind enough to put together a blog post, um, using this yarn as an example so that I could, I could point people to that, um, so that they can just, they take my yarn and then they just do what Holly tells them to do. And they will come up with a sock that will fit and that looks like what they were hoping for. Yes. And the other, the other nice, just, just because we're talking about Holly, the other really nice thing about Holly's patterns is that they're full of tutorials. Yes. So while it may be a, you know, a basic toe up sock pattern, it's, it, you know, you can, you can take that pattern. It's almost like a little booklet and do what you say, which is, you know, to work from the toe up and, and yeah, the structure of a toe up sock and the way that Holly writes her tip toe up sock pattern is really nice for um, placing the heel exactly where you want it without interrupting the striping sequence. And I think in your solar system yarn, if I recall correctly, you might have suggested that because the distance between the planets is so big, there's maybe, you know, at the upper end of the sock, there may be more gray than you want. You could take some of that gray and use it for the heel. Is that right? Yes. Did I get that right? Yeah. 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 It's a, I've um, started thinking of um, when I'm dying, I've started thinking of rather than thinking of what's the yarn going to look like, I try to think of like, what's the finished product going to look like. So if you're going to use this for socks, most people aren't going to use exactly one whole skein of yarn to make their socks for my sized foot. Um, about two thirds of a skein is going to make a pair of socks. So I want to plan a striping pattern that uses about two thirds of a skein. But then, as you say, like, but then you still need something for the rest um, because some people have bigger feet or want longer socks or, um, or want just to do something else completely different with it. So if we do something like add gray, then you can use that anywhere you want. Um, but you don't have to uh, make knee socks or whatever, just to, just to get the, all the planets on your, on your socks. I think you've also been doing some collaboration with Andrea Rangel. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Andrea Rangel. Um, you. <laughs> if you've only ever seen it uh, written down. Um, yeah. So, and that started, we do this every year and we count back, I think seven years ago. Um, because it, um, and that was, and it started as a club. Um, and the reason we decided to do it, and she was, I met her not at Knit City, but at Vibrations, which is our, um, in Victoria, our local um, fiber fair. Um, and at the time, I was still in the position where we'd put uh, yarn in the shop and it would sell out. And then I'd put more yarn in the shop and then it would sell out. Um, so working with designers was tricky because I didn't want them to put all this effort into a pattern and then people couldn't buy the yarn. So how do you sell a pattern when the yarn isn't available? I didn't want to put um, designers in that really awkward position. So we did it as a club where you sign up and you get both um, so that she knew she would be fairly compensated. Um, and then, and then if we offered the yarn again later, great, but 
but there was um so from like a business point of view that was a bit tricky especially in the early days and Andrea was up for giving it a try uh and it was it was a great challenge and we did some stuff that um I would never have done otherwise and she would never have done otherwise um because with those ones we would we would go back and forth with well how much yarn should be in the yellow and how much yarn should be in the orange um which you can only do which I can only do if you have instructions telling the person what to do when they get to that yellow part um so those have been really fun and I did there was I remember seeing some Instagram comments. Someone tagged their friend on one of my posts and said, hey, this is that dyer who dyes yarn for specific patterns. And I was like, oh, I don't think of myself that way, but I love that you think of me that way. I should lean into that a little. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? What kind of um, comments people make about you that... (laughs) you don't really know about until you read about on Instagram. It's kind of, yeah, it's very interesting. Um, Tell me a little bit about your name. You know, like I had held up some of this older yarn, Caterpillar Green, and then you went to Gage Dye Works. What's, is there a story behind that? Uh, The story I think is probably a very common people starting up their own business story, which was we had no idea what our name should be. And we just like needed something. Um, and I, at one point had had a paint chip, uh, like a green paint that said Caterpillar Green. And I had used that as my username on like maybe Flickr or something back in the day. Um, and so that just became our default. If we can't come up with something better, that's our name. And we just couldn't come up with something better. Um, but it was, it's long, it's a little bit awkward, um, especially if everything's online like the aspect ratio of the words is just wrong. Like you shouldn't have a long skinny name. Also people pointed out um, that cat G is also my name. And so they thought I'd like named it after myself, which I guess is no big deal. And I'm sure people do all the time, but I found that really embarrassing that I had like found this awkward name to celebrate myself in the, anyway. Um, So we had been wanting a different name almost since day one Uh, and it just took a while and once we decided we needed to it was like it's time we've just got to make this change the longer you leave it the harder it gets to change a name right yes um and once we came up with gauge we were like yes that it's a knitting word and it's it's a very like technical knitting word but it is also the the name for like measuring devices and that aspect of what we do as well um so it just seemed it seemed gauge really felt like a good fit and then it was just figuring out whether we were dye works or yarn co or color house or we went through a whole bunch of of options but then and then we just we just did it um Oh, so if anyone that. out there has a business and is thinking of changing their name, I recommend just do it as soon as you can and don't overthink it and and get it over with. <laughs> yeah. And make it short. Make it short. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we we have a funny story about that too. Being that our, our shop was River City Yarns, uh, we had a, a store that we had to purchase channel lettering for the front of the store, the the, the shop you know, the, the landlord wouldn't take anything but channel lettering. And then when you have to pay for each letter of your name, yes. <laughs> yes. Why, why, why didn't we call ourselves RCY? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Perfect. That's funny. And then when we transitioned, when we, when we closed our store and, and um, decided that we were going to really focus on teaching and learning and education, then we came up with a name that was super long, Yarniversity. And we had to tag it with by River City Yarns so that people would still connect the two together. Right. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's it's probably the the longest name in the yarn industry, but <laughs> that's how I think that works though, because people know the word university. So I, I feel like that that works. Yeah. Yeah. Reflects our personalities. It, it reflects our personalities too, because we like we like puns. You know, we like 
we like to, you know, have fun with words. And so that's part of it as well. Well, I like that. Catherine, I wanted to ask you about your yarn bases. Um, it, it seems to me, so again, I think you're absolutely right. We probably met up at, I, I remember going to Knit City and sometimes we would have our own booth. Sometimes we would partner with Holly. Sometimes we just come up, show up in Holly's booth and, you know, sell stuff to people. Um, but uh, every year I would go to, I, I would try to take a break and come over to your booth. And there was always this super long lineup. Uh, of people who were there specifically to buy your yarn and um, in my recollection it was always fingering weight yarn sometimes merino nylon sometimes merino cashmere nylon but this year when I went to your booth I found worsted weight yarn yes so I wanted to know is this a new thing or is this something you've always had and I just missed it before Um. It's uh, a little bit of both. I had tried um, heavier weights because people would would email and say, I do not love working with fingering weight yarn because it'll take me a year and a half. Like, what do you have for, you know, um, for just a, a quicker project? Um, so we had tried bits and pieces. And um, and actually, I think in the club with Andrea a few times, which is a nice way to to try something a little new because that's actually part of what people are signing up for is um, something like fun and interesting that they haven't seen somewhere else. Um, but I think people just aren't, it's just less popular because people knit shawls and socks with our yarn. Um, so we hadn't had a way we'd over the years tried a little bit here and there, but you sort of have to show people what to do with it because they just wouldn't really, wouldn't really know what, what to do with it um and then um the book came out with the uh, sweater arms in a worsted weight in a self-striping um yarn a worsted the worsted sock arm sweater by stephanie lot then and i was like okay here's our showcase and we got um some local test knitters to knit themselves sweaters with these beautiful colorful arms and just a solid body and I think that really helped us show people. And like, if you just want to knit a hat or you want to knit a pair of socks, absolutely you can. But I think it took finding like a showcase pattern to show people what they can do with it um, to really catch people's attention and make them be like, oh, that's what I'll do with it. That's right. I think I think yeah. that's exactly what your booth helper told me about was the, you know, when I brought it up to her, she said, oh, you know, this was kind of one of the thing that you can do with it are these did you call it sock arms I, yeah sock arms i'll i'll look it up and put a I put a photo in here for that that's it's really intriguing what a great idea mm -hmm. yokes too like um do you uh, make coordinating colors in solids um at the moment i have grays and that's it <laughs> uh, uh, part of that is just my own um, worrying about different color law or different dye lots being noticeably different and worrying that um, if I don't dye, like if I did one skein for a yoke and then one skein for the body, that the yoke was striping and the body was a solid color. If there's a red up here and you want it to match the red in the body perfectly, then I have to dye them at the same time. And the logistics of then like sweater kits but what sizes and anyway it just feels overwhelming so so far I've only ever done grays that coordinate okay but I and certainly do um get requests for that because it would be it would be great yeah yeah, yeah. and um are, are you set up with your equipment to do other yarn bases like mohairs can, can you do other fibers or is it really specific for fingering weight sock, merino nylon? That's a good question. So we, um, well, like any other dyer who uses acid dyes, we, we can only dye protein fibers. So things like cotton, I just can't dye with our dyes. Um, we do dye worsted and that works pretty well, but I think that might be about the bulkiest we can dye um, just because of because of how much time it takes and you need to give the dye time to get into the center of the fiber. 
Saturation, yeah. To, to saturate. Um, and then there's things like mohair or even like a a single ply, like a really loosely spun that you might use for a shawl. Mm -hmm. um, any any yarn that's like super fluffy. Um, I'm not sure. We haven't tried mohair specifically, and I've always been curious about it, but I feel like the possibility of it snagging or catching on itself um, makes me uh, nervous. I see. Yeah. Maybe it has to be a mohair blend. You know, wool, yeah. wool and mohair blended together. That might be kind of cool. Yeah, and that is something. Playing around with um, some fun yarn bases is something I would love to put some time into. What's what's on the future? What where is um, Gage Dye Works going? Um, we we heard about you know your new worsted yarn. Is that something that you've got plans for? Um, yeah, I would I would love to work with more worsted weight. Um, I think that's a lot of fun. And one of the challenges I've had, like our solar system yarn is, I think by far our most popular yarn ever. So of course, like, well, I should do a worsted weight version of that. Um, and then one of the challenges I've come up with is um, there's just not enough yarn in a skein of worsted weight to fit everything in that I want to fit in. Um, so that's a fun challenge that I, I'm, I'm looking forward to. Um, and I've also been really enjoying these sort of like data visualization projects, like the solar system where there's um, the different stripes have different meanings. Um, I would love to spend a bit more time on projects like that. Um, if I can, the the one that I'm just working on now or that I just, just put in the shop yesterday um, is these guys here, which is, um, this is a family of whales. So this is um, each each of the colorful stripes is a different individual whale. Um, there's a, a group of whales called J Pod. Who I don't know if you've if you've taken BC ferries and looked out and been lucky enough to see orcas, you've seen one of these whales. You would have seen J Pod in all likelihood. Um, so the um, skinnier stripes are the younger, uh, like the juvenile whales, and the thicker stripes are older. And the color tells you. Um, whether they're male or female. So like this would be um, the oldest female there. Um, this is an older male and these little guys are like juvenile males and juvenile females. Um, and, and since I'm talking about this too, so the reproductive age females are these kind of orangey ones and these bright red ones. So we're cheering for them because uh, when you have a population that's, that's endangered, um, you need babies, so you need reproductive age females. Um, anyway, so I've been working on projects like this that I just get, um, I think that's really fun to be able to put a story behind it. And then hopefully people find it beautiful and nice to look at on its own without the story. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I, I would love to work on more of that type of project. Your socks reminded me of birds. There's so many birds out there and so many beautiful birds. Do you have, um, are you limited in the amount of different colors that you can have? Or can you have like a three colored stripe? Um, I can have, um, I'm not sure what you mean by three colored stripe, but. Well, can you have like a skein of yarn with just three colors in it? Yeah. Yeah. Or absolutely. you could have one with 72. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's such a range. That's so incredible. That would be a designer's heaven, wouldn't it? You could, uh, you could do so much. I'm sending you pictures of birds. Okay. I actually have, and I, I don't think I have a sample beside me. I'm just going to look behind me here. Uh, so my collaboration with um, Andrea Rangel last summer was birds. So this oh. is our. Anna's hummingbird sock, um, where each one of those is is a hummingbird. And yes. You'll have to use your imagination a little bit because this is just just some yarn and not a pair of socks. Um, but each group of three here is a different bird, 
um, Andrea is a birder. Well, she's a bird photographer who, you know, learns the, the names and calls of the birds as she goes out with all the birders. Um, so uh, wow. so this was our project last year um, where we came up with eight of the most popular birds in our area popular by like how many birds there are in the world but also popular by how many people on instagram told us they loved that bird um and so we put them all in a sock and we tried to pick each group of three should sort of feel like that bird so there's like a stellar's jay here a northern flicker anna's hummingbird something thrush Anyway, we've got all of them. And then there was a bunch of ducks that didn't make it. Um, this is a duck, but a lot of ducks are beautiful. Uh, but like real 70s. And when I tried to translate them into colors, they just didn't look super beautiful. So they they didn't make the cut. Um, and then anyway, Andrea's pattern, her sock pattern for this, um, had a little area. I don't know if my camera will pick it up. There's some pearl ridges in there. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a thing called a birding checklist, which shows you the species of bird. And then for the 12 months of the year, when you are most likely to see that bird in our area. So she translated that checklist um, here so that for each different bird on the, um, for each different bird on the sock, she had encoded in it the checklist like frequency of, of what times of year you are most likely to see this bird. Oh my God, that is so cool. It's like a temperature scarf for birding. Yes. <laughs> is, is yeah, that so we had, we had a lot of fun with that one. So we did the, um, this was actually one pair of socks. Like one sock had these ones and the other sock had those ones. Um, and then we went and also made individual skeins for each bird. Uh, because if you want matching socks, you want matching socks. Um, are those but that, was fun, still, that was a fun project last year. Are those still available on your website? They are out of stock right now, okay. um, but I will be um, dying more of those because people have people have really loved that one. Yeah, yeah, that's really nice. Is uh, do you? I mean, I can't remember. It's been a while since I've been there, but can people pre-order um, color waves? Uh, no, sometimes like right now I do have actually a few things that are a pre-order, but most of the stuff, um, uh, no, I don't, I don't take pre-orders. Okay. That's fair. That's totally fair. And, uh, and you're, you're doing all right with shipping, you know, like I, for us, that was another thing that's kind of, you know, since COVID has become probably the most expensive part of anything, right? Yeah, shipping is um, shipping is very expensive, and it it sucks as the business, and it sucks as the customer. And I know, even though I know it's expensive, and I know um, small businesses are all trying to find a way to offer free shipping, even though it's not free. Um, even as a business owner, I still go shopping online at other people's websites and think, "Ooh, twelve dollars for shipping." You know, like it, I'm sure it costs them that much. I just don't want to pay it. <laughs> um, yeah. So it, um, our, our customers are understanding. Um, and I think also this might be why we have a lot of customers in the U S uh, I mean, there's a lot of people in the U S so it, it makes sense, but also um, it is actually cheaper for me to ship to the United States than it is to ship to most of Canada. So I'm able to offer better rates. Uh, shipping to the U.S., yeah, which like eats me away inside, but I don't get to decide these things. So, well, we have some tips for people who you know for Canadians who are shopping. First of all, I'll, you know, I'll, I always look to see how much do I have to order to get free shipping, because that's a possibility. And then you know, if you just team up with a few friends, it, you know, if you order one skein of solar system yarn, your sister's going to want one skein of right. so solar system yarn as well, right? And then, you know, you might want to make more than one hat or more than one pair of socks. So you might as well just double the order, get four skeins, and then, you know, you've got you've got yourself covered. Uh, and 
cuts down on and the a few grain, a few skeins of gray because gray is the best neutral that you could possibly get. And that can go with everything. Yeah, yeah, and we do we do have um, a few like a free shipping um, cut off um, for exactly this reason, and and we do get orders of you know four of this and four of that, uh, and then a, a nice little note being like, "This is for my whole group." <laughs> Which, if you wanted to buy it and knit it all yourself, I mean, I that's wonderful. No I really appreciate your business. You don't have to explain, but uh, but there are people who do feel the need to like it's it's not all for me. Yeah, that's funny. So, do you have any other collaborations planned, Catherine? Um, I actually made a few connections at Knit City, um, and then got um, quite separately a few emails. And I'm just trying to think, I think all of those are in such early stages. I probably shouldn't say it's happening for oh, sure. Yes. Um, but Stephanie Lotvin, who I mentioned earlier, um, she does a lot of design work specifically for self-striping yarn. Um, so I don't have a project planned with her, but I do um, like I have, I have intentions that she doesn't know about to just have some samples made up in her patterns. Um, and hopefully we can uh, collaborate in the future. Nice. Um, I took a class when I was at Knit City with Cecilia Campanchero. Yeah. And she was rather uh, enthralled as well. And I think she has a bit of a sort of a technical mind. Uh, and so she really was, I think, planning something in her head with your yarns. And I was thinking, oh, I love, I love her simplicity in knitting where she uses texture to yes. create patterning and I thought this might be something really beautiful to do a Cecilia textured shawl with hmm. what are your thoughts on this one I think that would work beautifully with some texture mm -hmm. yeah I do find um there's so many beautiful patterns that just don't make sense if you already have self-striping yarn yeah. You know, if you have cables or something that goes this way and then stripes that go that way, I just feel like they fight each other. Um, whereas the texture runs along the stripes. Yes. And just kind of um, enhances both. They both kind of enhance each other and play off each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Cecilia was kind enough to come by our booth. So I did get to meet her in person, uh, which was wonderful. And we chatted a bit and I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that she will uh, she will do something with our yarn. Yeah, because that would I would love to see what her brain comes up with for sure. Yes, yeah, that would be really wonderful. Catherine, can people purchase your yarn in retail shops? Are you, are you available in retail shops, or is, or is it all through the festivals that you attend and your online website? Yeah, right now it is just through the website and through um, just Vibrations in Knit City at the moment are the only ones we attend. I would love to start doing, um, just like on, on the business side, we we can't really justify doing wholesale. We would have to raise our prices in order to offer wholesale rates and it, it just doesn't make sense. But as a, like a, a trunk show or a, um, I would love to start thinking about ways to to partner with yarn shops even if it is just for a weekend or just for an event or just for a, a small order but I haven't um I haven't set aside the mental energy to to make any of that happen so for now it is basically just on the website I think I think there's a maybe and I'm just going to put this out there and see what happens with it but maybe there's an opportunity in the future to do a collaboration with you uh uh Catherine and your university because I'm thinking as we're talking about shawls you know we have Kate Atherley coming up in November she's going to teach a class called easy shawl starts and we have um Bristol Ivy is also coming to teach uh, top down shawl construction and it'd be so fun to you know be able to use uh you know one of your shawl striping yarns in in one of those classes uh, to just to, you know because everybody's invited to kind of play with it and do their own thing and so it might be kind of fun maybe you know down the road to do something where you know we teach a class specifically using your yarn because well, that well we should definitely be in touch about that that sounds amazing and that actually reminds me that Kate Atherley 
does have a shawl pattern that I think used the blue version of that fade to black um, that you have um, that was sort of a half shawl. Um, Okay. I think that it's a really great opportunity to, to help people learn knitting techniques um, by using color. You know, sometimes if you can say to them, you know, um, knit, you know, five stitches in this color, or if you have a color change or striping, um, it can be a nice, easy way to teach. And I'm really excited about the worsted weight because I think that you'd get through into different colors faster, Mm. which from an education perspective might be easy. We can maybe teach around that. Yeah, I know when I started knitting, I think the reason I liked self-striping yarns was it just like socks take a long time when you're new. And especially when you keep making mistakes and like, where did these extra stitches come from? And um, I think the reason I liked self-striping yarn so much when I first started out was it's just so rewarding. Like every five rows you've accomplished, like I'm on a different color now. Like, look at me go. Um, Whereas with a solid color, you need to go six inches before something happens, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I think it is a, a a fun way. And then you can start, yeah, like every fourth stripe, why don't you add some texture or you can add start adding your own personality in there, your own elements, or you just like if you get bored of stocking it, then how about the green stripes are in ribbing? You know? <laughs> That's a great Do you idea. Still crochet? Um not much. I never found it. To, I'd always my thumb would always get sore. The last time I tried to pick it up again, I uh, I would need to take some ergonomic crochet lessons to get back into it. I think, um, but I do still every once in a while. I will still. I'll see someone crocheting something in our yarn, and I think I really need to um, either do that myself or get some more of that. Um, photograph because there is no reason you can't crochet with self-striping yarn Mm -hmm. and it's quite a bit faster too isn't it you could see you can really start to see your progress quickly in crochet yeah yeah when when you're not dyeing yarn Catherine and when you're not you know collaborating with others and running your business what do you love to do what's your downtime thing that really relaxes you and you love to do I well, um, I am a very quiet person, so knitting suits me very well. Okay, uh, I do really enjoy like doing a crossword puzzle and sipping a cup of tea and all these like just nice, quiet, um, on my own things. Um, but I also do like getting outdoors um, and just like being outside. Um, and I have recently, just in the past year or so, gotten back into rock climbing, which is a sport I took up in my early 20s and then just kind of stopped um, and have gotten back into it. And it's great. It's fun. Um, and it can be very social in a way that works for me. I feel like the closest I've ever come as an adult to, you know, kids at the playground Um, You can just make friends with anyone by going up to any other kid and being like, I like the slide too. And now you're friends and you can go on the slide together. Um, I feel like the closest I've ever come to that, the like ease of just talking to someone as, as an adult is at the climbing gym, bouldering, where you can just be like, Hey, what did you do there? And suddenly you have a best friend for the next half hour. Um, So that's been a really fun thing that I've been uh, doing lately that, that is just for me. That's been great. Well, that's so nice, Catherine. I I want to thank you for spending the time with us today to talk about your business, and uh, and about your you know your sense of color and your collaborations and what you enjoy doing. It's been really delightful to get to know you a little better. And so, thank you for taking the time to come out and chat with us today. Well, thank you. This has been a lot of fun. Have a great week. Thanks so much for having me. This was fun. Bye. Great. So it wasn't too scary, right? Not too scary. (laughs) Not too scary. (laughs) 